introducing you, Cameron. Cameron Alahian is a high-tech entrepreneur with three unicorn IPOs, three. Cameron is founder and chairman of Global Innovation Catalyst and advises various governments on the needed transition from fossil-based economies to sustainable innovation economies. Actually, this is how I was fortunate enough to meet Cameron when he visited and was advising the, the government of the Republic of Kazakhstan when I was working there. Um, and uh, in the past, as a global high-tech entrepreneur, Cameron co-founded 10 companies, had six exits, three of them were unicorn IPOs with a total market capitalization of over $8 billion. For 15 years, he was chairman of Global Catalyst Partners, a global VC firm, 350 million under management with investments in the US, Japan, China, India, Israel, and Singapore. I can tell you firsthand from my knowing Cameron, he travels literally all over the world all the time, uh, doing many, many different uh, amazing things. Underlying his vision for global philanthropy is the conviction that modern information and communication technologies, ICT, can be instrumental in dissolving barriers between nations and bridging the social and political differences among people. This vision was reflected in Schools Online, a nonprofit he co-founded in 1996 to connect the world, one school at a time. 6,400 schools in 36 countries were provided with computers and access to the internet and merged with Relief International in 2003. His vision was reflected in Global Catalyst Foundation. He co-founded that in 2000 to improve lives through effective education and empowerment of the youth with em special emphasis on young women uh, using the leverage of ICT. And finally, uh, this vision was reflected in UNGAID, a United Nations global forum that promotes ICT in developing countries where he served as co-chairman between 2009 and 2011. Without further ado, it's a privilege and an honor to have you, Cameron. I'm so excited to hear from you again. You're a good friend, and we really appreciate you joining us today at Mays Business School, Texas A&M University. Thank you, dear friend Richard. Very kind of you for this invitation, and it's uh, my honor and pleasure to uh, meet uh, all of you and uh, as I was quickly scanning all of the videos, I uh, see so many happy, uh, smiling faces. Uh, so uh, a big uh, virtual hug to all of you. Uh, I was thinking uh, that uh, I talk a little bit about uh, the future as uh, I see it's happening, and it's all related to innovation economy. Uh, so uh, it might not be so obvious. So let me talk about it and then um, as uh, we go forward, if uh, you see that something does not make sense, uh, feel free to uh, stop me and ask your questions. On the other token, uh, if you think uh, it's okay, uh, we can uh, wait and at the end of uh, my talk, uh, we can uh, uh, ask, uh, entertain all of your uh, questions. So, uh, let's start this. Uh, I will not go over my background since Richard was so complimentary and talked about it. Uh, but uh, as a economy, around uh, 12,000 years ago, we had the agricultural economy as uh, our ancestors moved from the uh, caves into villages and started to learn uh, agriculture. Uh, the industrial economy started around 18th century. Uh, the knowledge economy started in 20th century as uh, uh, the uh, internet started to come, had a huge impact on diffusion of the knowledge and uh, uh, creation of a situation that a lot of people could come up, uh, have access to knowledge and uh, could come up uh, with uh, new ways of uh, learning about things. Uh, uh, but 21st century uh, has been uh, really this last 20 years or so. Uh, has started to be dominated uh, by innovation economy. And if I had to uh, put innovation economy in one word, uh, the word I would select would be disruption. Uh, let's talk about it a little bit uh, on the differences between innovation economy versus knowledge economy. And knowledge economy 
knowledge was king. And if you had the ability to go and learn many things and memorize it, uh, you would be king and you would have a lot of uh, uh, value stored in your head and uh, you would be encouraged uh, to keep those ideas to yourself because other people could steal your ideas and uh, the value of patents was very high, uh, trade secrets were very important and uh, ideas uh, were extremely important. Uh, I was uh, one of the countries uh, that uh, I advise uh, is a country of uh, Ethiopia, uh, which has a very enlightened uh, new prime minister with background in ICT. But as enlightened as that the prime minister has been, I, I was hosting a delegation in here and uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, they, uh, I was reading as they were visiting us that they had a, a, a one day of shut off of the whole internet. And I asked the Minister of Higher Education who was in delegation, I said, why is it uh, that uh, all the internet is uh, turned off? And uh, she said that, uh, well, it's the day of national exams. And uh, uh, if we let people use the internet, they will use their laptops, their uh, cell phones and uh, they will uh, Google the answers and uh, they would cheat. And I said, what is the value of education that you are giving to people if somebody with access uh, to uh, broadband internet uh, can actually um, get that access within five minutes? And that's not uh, much of a value in that. In um, innovation economy, ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the execution, implementation, the soft skills that we will discuss more that really determine who has the ability to generate wealth and who has the ability to generate value system and power. Uh, it's not based on ideas. Now let's look at one of the most fantastic uh, uh, companies out there, uh, Microsoft. Many of the ideas that Microsoft has were copied from Apple. Uh, Apple first came up with the ideas and then uh, Microsoft uh, copied it. Then you go and say, well, then Apple was uh, the originator of ideas. Hell no. <laughs> you know, uh, when I started 10 companies, uh, we talked about the three which were successful. Uh, unicorns, but they also uh, had three huge failures and uh, uh, I was fired twice. My biggest failure was a, a company called Momento Computer, which was iPad 18 years before iPad. So Apple didn't have the idea for uh, iPad as a new idea. Uh, I didn't have it. Before me, if you go back, you read the idea of an uh, iPad type of a thing, uh, uh, called Dynabook, uh, that uh, many papers were published about it. Uh, we think uh, we love Google and uh, the idea of Google as a search engine was fantastic idea. Well, Google was the seventh company who tried to implement a search engine. There was uh, InfoSeq, Ask Jeev, uh, Excite, uh, Alta Vista, Yahoo, so many companies before Google. And so ideas are a dime a dozen. Anybody can come up with ideas. It's who can go and implement and execute that idea. Who has the courage to go take that idea into experimentation. So it's a very, very key thing to know we are in a whole different uh, economy. And it's very different. We have never had anything like it before. Now, if there is one thing I hope you will take from my uh, talk today is remember this pyramid. Uh, I learned about this pyramid uh, from an amazing, crazy professor in 1980. Uh, he didn't describe it as a pyramid. Uh, he just gave me some ideas that I created this chart in 1980. 
uh, 40 years ago. And this was the basics, my secret recipe, my, uh, camp, uh, my compass on helping me figure out how the world was going to change. Uh, anything we do in life, in any sector, in any geography, goes through this pyramid from manual to mechanical, electromechanical, microelectronic, software to algorithmic content. So uh, one time about three years ago, I was uh, giving a lecture uh, for uh, innovation economy for all the economists of World Bank. And uh, so I created this slide for the world of finance. Uh, this is a manual uh, in the world of finance. This is a mechanical and abacus. Uh, this is an adding machine electromechanical. A calculator revolutionized the world of finance. A spreadsheet and PC revolutionized the world of finance again. But future of finance is algorithmic content. You better learn about blockchain and the impact it's going to have on uh, uh, sharing of the ideas, distributed ledger, uh, transparency, uh, all sorts of things which are uh, uh, extremely, extremely important. And if a financial institution doesn't recognize the uh, future of finance uh, will disappear. Uh, since we are uh, looking at this, we can use this as a guide to see in whatever sector you guys are working on, when is that inflection point? When is that shift coming? from uh, electromechanical to microelectronic or from microelectronic to software, where is the highest value creation there? Since I'm talking to an educational institution, let's look at the, this pyramid. How does that apply in the world of education? Here is education in manual uh, with the Gutenberg uh, press. Education uh, became mechanical and uh, it wasn't just the property of a few churches and mosques and uh, synagogues and the religious people which uh, only had access to it. It became widely available. Uh, Electromechanical printing press took it to the next level of productivity, but it really was with microelectronics, the invention of the PC and later on uh, with uh, uh, the internet that this started uh, to uh, really become available in the hands of everybody and the fact that uh, right now uh, we are using the software like Zoom uh, to have effectively an online course, it says that we are moving within this pyramid. Uh, but where is the future? What is it uh, that uh, is in store for us in the field of education? You know, education 1.0 was about creation of the content, education 2.0, was use the internet to uh, diffuse it and distribute it all over. Education 3.0, there is all this stuff available, whether it's books, whether it's articles, uh, everything has been digitized, lots of new research, multiple languages, uh, a lot of videos, uh, online courses, Education is moving from being theoretical to experiential and is moving from being needing a teacher that teaches to experiential learning. Uh, learners start to go and learn and the role of the teacher changes to be more as a coach, as a mentor that says, hey, let me guide you through this huge maze of the amazing things and help you find your own path and giving you exercises, things, pushing you to go and do experiments to learn and come back and I'll help you find the answers if you can't find it yourself. So it's not anymore teaching, it is learning and it's not learning theoretical, it's experiential. So if we are looking at where the future of the world is, as this pyramid penetrates every single sector, every vertical, every market, every geography, the world is going to change and the pyramid becomes inverted pyramid. Very few things are going to be done by hand and the things which are done mechanically, electromechanically are all going to be done by 
the robots and that the value creation is on the software and on algorithmic content in every field. Now I'm not talking about software that uh, you just uh, go and uh, uh, everybody becomes a software programmer. That's not what I'm talking about. It's everybody learning how to use the leverage of software and leverage of algorithmic content in whatever they are doing. <clears throat> just to prove a point, in 2009, 11 years ago, the top 10 highest value companies were ExxonMobil, PetroChina, Walmart, China Mobile, Procter & Gamble, Microsoft, ICBC, Johnson & Johnson, and AT&T. But within 10 years, because of innovation economy, because of importance of software, the leverage of software and algorithmic content, in 2019, the highest value companies were Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, Berkshire Hathaway, Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent, Johnson & Johnson, and ExxonMobil. So ExxonMobil went from highest value on the top to still high value, but at the bottom within the list of top 10. And many other ones disappeared. And who would have thought? that these young companies like Facebook, Alibaba, Tencent, Alibaba did not start in Silicon Valley, Tencent did not start in Silicon Valley. The world of innovation changed the things upside down. And the world has changed. It has disrupted everything. And within this process, many, many, many businesses have disappeared and many more are going to disappear. many, many more are going to disappear. We all know how the bookstores disappeared as uh, uh, Amazon started to go and use its software to deliver the books to you uh, uh, quickly within a day or, uh, or two days or so at the beginning. Then it went into creating digital books so you didn't even need the paper book and the printing press and all of that. We all know that. But you remember we used to have these music stores, Virgin music stores. You would go there and put these fancy headphones on in major cities around the world and uh, listen to CDs to decide which one you want. Very fancy business. All disappeared. Do you remember all of those um, fancy uh, uh, blockbuster? Uh, rental video, uh, you would go there to, uh, you know, it was growing like mushroom all over the world, uh, the video rental business. Well, it's all gone because of uh, Netflix, because of Vimeo, because of uh, YouTube. Everything goes through that and you watch one good movie on uh, Netflix, it uses in its algorithmic content to say, well, uh, chances are 95% that you will also enjoy this one, you buy a book from Amazon, it says I would recommend this other thing that you may want to buy because it goes side by side with that. And the users like you within your own demographics have appreciated this thing. So it is going on and on. And within that pyramid, transportation is changing. Uh, before the COVID-19, the highest value transportation company in United States was Uber had a higher value than General Motors plus Chrysler plus Ford. And all it did was software and algorithmic content to connect the passengers and connect the uh, uh, drivers together. And this is the future when we recognize the power of that pyramid as business people, as entrepreneurs, we can start to see the inflection points and say, where is the opportunity? Where is disruption happening? How can we go and create new businesses to really profit from the chaotic situation that existed? Now, because of COVID-19, a lot has changed. 
uh, as work from home grows, more and more people are saying, well, why was it that we had to go and sit in an office, especially in a noisy office with a lot of distraction, whatever? And why should I put up with all the stupid commute? So a lot of office real estate prices are going to plummet significantly and uh, many of businesses which have been in commercial real estate will go belly up, will go bankrupt. People recognize that, hey, they can be more productive. Maybe they should only meet once a week or twice a week for a special meeting. So a lot of co-working spaces will change and create these conference rooms for rent that uh, people can go and uh, reserve it in advance and have uh, meetings of group of three, four, five people for a small company or 500 people for a big company once a week, twice a week, uh, meet with each other when that is needed. But because people are not going to commute uh, as much, the fuel and power consumption is going to be less oil companies, gas companies are going to go bankrupt. Forget about coal. I mean, that was one of the craziest things, trying to go against the economics to save the coal industry. It's a backward thinking. But when solar is free and with emergence of solid state batteries, the price of storage of batteries, solid state is going to be so low, nothing can compare that. And if you can, if you're living in a place that has a lot of sun, why do you need to uh, pollute the air, destroy the environment, do a lot of things? I know you guys are being from Houston, this might be uh, a little bit tough for <laughs> some of you to accept it, uh, but I always speak my mind and I talk about uh, how I see it and I've been wrong many times before. So if you want to ignore me, that's perfectly fine also. But the oil and gas companies are going to go out of business. The car sales are going to go out of business. Uh, I've already seen it on some of the companies that I'm familiar with, how their um, car companies are closing plants and uh, uh, letting go of their workers. Traffic congestion will be reduced. Uh, I spend three weeks every year in Barcelona. It's one of the smartest cities in the planet. If you haven't been there, go and visit it. It's a, a joy to be there. And the mayor of Barcelona every year uh, takes one of the busiest streets and closes it down and says from uh, next year, no more traffic in here and makes it parks. And you would say, how could that be possible? Well, people can use the public transportation. They can use bicycles that are very cheaply available to go around, get healthy. And uh, if you make it as parks and put in a lot of nice trees and whatever, good things will happen. For the first time you see in Manhattan, city of New York is looking at closing down some streets and making a few miles of streets available as new parks to be created. So the world is changing. There will be a rise in productivity aware employees. All of us very quickly have learned this whole idea of video conferencing using Zoom is not a new idea. Uh, I remember in the uh, 1990s, we started uh, to buy uh, uh, these uh, systems for video conferencing. The difference is in those days, every time we wanted to have a video conference, we had to have a special IT person come and set it up and set up the cameras and make sure everything is going great. And uh, yeah, there were lots of glitches. Now everybody uses a simple thing like a, a Zoom or Google Hangout or Team or, uh, from Microsoft and bang, or WebEx from Cisco, bang, <laughs> within a few seconds, anybody uh, can have access to this. So when you become aware and there is a shift in the mindset that, hey, this is normal to have a video conference and uh, it was a no-no for years. Or, uh, we didn't have a compelling need to do it. Now that we do, very quickly we learn and we say, do we really need all of the face-to-face -face meeting? Some we do. There are still a lot of businesses and things that we need to be meeting face-to-face, -face, but the number is not 100% of the meeting. It might be down to 20% of the meeting. 80% can be done video conference because 
it has become normal for business. Time with family. Well, we went into everybody would be just their heads on the screen and uh, nobody would pay attention to their family, to paying too much attention to the family to the level that after a couple of months, many people are saying, we have enough of family. I want to run out and do something different. But after this, we have a proper balance to learn what sorts of things I do it with the family and what sorts of things I go to work or I go in another place, have face-to-face -face meetings and uh, do different. And of course, cleaner air, calmer cities. We see the birds are chirping more, good things are happening. Uh, I'm sure uh, if you do a simple Google search, uh, you see the for the first time after so many years, uh, nice pictures of uh, landmarks in uh, New Delhi, India, without pollution, uh, nice uh, things in Beijing, uh, within the inner ring of Beijing, which uh, if any of you had uh, gone to Beijing uh, during this uh, things just uh, up to a few months ago, uh, your eyes would start to really uh, be full of uh, uh, tears due to pollution and uh, the inner rings of Beijing were horrible, horrible, absolutely. So the world is changing because of COVID and in my opinion, it's changing for the better and it's actually emphasizing the move towards that mirror uh, pyramid to the top. Now, I have had this project started about five years ago, this crazy vision that because of these changes in disruption, because the world is changing, uh, we need to go and help create jobs of future for the people because there is huge, huge change going on. Now, some of the countries I advise who have huge reliance on oil and gas happen to also have a lot of young people. And that those people are really concerned because they see the young people without jobs as a huge liability. And if young people don't have jobs and they become restless, they become uh, uh, very unhappy, they want uh, to have a uh, good livelihood. And uh, if they can't be satisfied, there are revolutions, uh, they become gangsters, they become terrorists, they become drug addicts, they become, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> all sorts of uh, dire predictions. All you need to do is read one of the World Bank or UN reports about the liabilities of uh, having large number of youth. I look at it as a completely different. I see that because of knowledge economy, uh, the invention of the computers and the first version of broadband allowed us to diffuse knowledge and it democratized the knowledge. So knowledge did not belong to the elite rich people. It became available to everyone. You know, uh, I was born in Iran when uh, I uh, was uh, uh, going to high school, if I wanted access to some uh, advanced technical report from MIT or Stanford, uh, I had to wait 10 to 20 years before it would get to me. But it, because of knowledge economy, uh, within a few minutes, whatever is invented, any part of the world is available to everyone. Uh, so knowledge economy democratized. Uh, the knowledge and allowed everybody to use the internet to uh, have access uh, to the knowledge and uh, that is fantastic but innovation economy takes it to the next step because it's disrupting everything that we do all the channels of distribution that are controlled by old men in charge are being disrupted. So knowledge economy, democratized knowledge, innovation economy allows young people to come up with new ideas and because they don't need to, uh, to use the old channels of distribution, they can create new economies, new businesses without the blessing 
of the old men in charge. And if we look at the basics of innovation economy, it is a lot of differences. It's gig economy. People do not work in one company for 20 years, 30 years and retire. They, a lot of uh, full-time jobs are disappearing. People do one or two or three gigs, a few hours of this, a few hours of that, a few hours of the things, and they use the leverage of technology to have their fingers into many things. And guess what? When you are doing multitasking, when you are looking at doing things concurrently, young women have certain advantages over young men. When I was growing up, all I had to do was be a good boy and get good grades. My sister, who was only three years older than me, she had to be a good girl, had to get good grades. She had to take care of me, take care of my younger brother, help my mom with shopping for groceries and help my mom with cooking. So from very early age, she learned about the gig economy. She learned about multitasking, setting up priorities, develop algorithms on how she would go and do all these different things, responsibilities that she had to do from very young age. And that's the typical in many families. So innovation economy has a chance for the first time in evolution of our species, not only give power to the youth to create more money, but give advantage to women for the first time. Now, a key, a key lever for making innovation economy happen is what I call iTechpreneurship. It is high-tech entrepreneurship leveraged by broadband internet. That's where magic happens. And broadband internet is going through significant changes. Within the next three, four years, low orbit satellites are going to provide broadband internet. I'm not talking about one or two megabits per second nonsense on that. We are talking about gigabits per second available to everywhere all over the world. Look at what SpaceX is doing. Look at what Amazon is doing. Look at what OneWeb is doing. The world is changing. All of these telcos that you know, from AT&T to Verizon to uh, Sprint, uh, Deutsche Telekom, uh, France Telekom, all of these are going to go out of business. Uh, they are laggards. Uh, they are controlled by old men in charge who don't understand technology and don't have idea of how the world is changing. It will be the companies like Amazon, like Google, who would be driving to make broadband be available to everyone for free because they make their money through different business models. And it's better to give access to broadband, huge broadband for free and make money other ways. Now, why is iTechpreneurship so important? I'll give you an example. When I started my first company in 1980, it was still at the time of knowledge economy. So ideas were very, very valuable. So I wanted to raise money to build my MVP, minimum viable product, my prototype, to see whether the idea I had would work. It was an engineering workstation to help the engineers design chips, design integrated circuits using computer graphics. To get my first prototype ready, I had to raise $1.8 million. Why? Because I had to buy all the servers, I had to pay for uh, all the software licenses. Today, because of broadband and because of emergence of a very high-speed broadband, 
you can go and start your own company with less than $50,000 to get your prototype working because we have so much of cloud available, pay as you go software, shareware, freeware, all sorts of things. So the world has changed and the world of entrepreneurship has been disrupted. It's iTechpreneurship. And the jobs of the future have a whole bunch of hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills primarily is learning about algorithmic content, learning about artificial intelligence, big data, learning about deep, deep learning by computers. That mindset for algorithmic thinking, computational thinking, used to be only taught in PhD programs, then in master's programs. Some universities have it in bachelor teaching AI, robotics, uh, big data, data uh, analysis, whatever. But it should be taught at the K-12. And what is my favorite company on that? A spin-off from Stanford, and I've had the honor, my wife and I, to be the uh, founding investors uh, on this. It's called polyop.com. It teaches the hard skills of AI for K-12, all for free. Go and check it out, it would blow your mind how kids can use uh, this at a very young age, learn to control their drones, control their robots, all virtual drones and virtual robots using AI. It's a whole new world. And the people who learn how to do this are getting prepared for the jobs of the future. Now, in the past, universities have had been operating as silos. You have engineering school, you have business school, you have design school, you have social sciences schools. Each one of these have been silos. The universities who start to blend these things together. Why did Stanford create Silicon Valley? Because Professor Chairman, 40 years ago, figured out that they need to teach entrepreneurship, not at the School of Business, but at the School of Engineering. And he was a visionary guy, and he started to go and bring business school skills to engineering school. I'm sure you guys are looking at how to blend. Uh, I was having discussions uh, with Professor Arvin about how to bl blend the business concepts with technical expertise together. But don't forget the design school. Don't forget the creative arts. It is extremely important. The difference between Apple products that you just tap on your iPhone and it wakes up versus Windows products that you have to hold three fingers, control, alt, delete to go and get your computer to wake up is Steve Jobs had understanding of design concepts, understanding of design thinking, understanding of user interface. Bill Gates did not. And that drove different philosophies within Microsoft and within Apple. So if universities are created that ideal situation, my recommendation to any university is create a technology hub within your own university and attract engineering students, business students, design students together and say, come over here. We give you some co-working space, giving you some subsidies to start your own incubator, invite some speakers, uh, some uh, uh, people, coaches who can help you accelerate your ideas. If you have money, buy some uh, fab labs and makerspace things, so let the people experiment with it. And if you have money, create a small microphone that any student who came up with some idea Give them $5,000, $10,000, maybe $20,000 to go and experiment. Create a company, create a product, do something. 
not because this way you are going to create unicorns. Look at it as experiential learning, capacity development. Just go back and think about why you became an engineering student or business student or design student. Many of us became engineers because our parents told us the choices for me as a kid growing up in Iran was either be a doctor or be an engineer. I, my sins might be forgiven if I became a lawyer, but preference was doctor or engineer. I didn't know how good of an engineer I was. I was a horrible engineer. Thank God I learned through starting my own company that I learned, hey, I'm better in business. And I learned that I'm not so good to be a CEO, but I learned I'm much better as a chairman. And I learned about my good skills, strengths, and my weaknesses. And through that, I was able to create multi-billion dollar companies by experimentation. So this kind of structure is the structure of the university of future. Now, many countries, when I talk to minister of education, they don't agree with me. They don't believe in this. And independent of the university structures in many countries, there are these take ups that are springing up all over the world. Here is Africa. I'm advisor to a group called Afri Labs. Uh, we keep track of all of the uh, African tech hubs. There is over 600 tech hubs all over Africa. 243 of them are members of Afri Labs. These are the number of tech hubs in Middle East, in various countries from Jordan to Kuwait, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, UAE. Huge number of these. Why? Because their university systems are not giving the type of education that people, when they finish university, can get a job. So they go through these take ups to create the jobs themselves. Why? Because young people are not afraid to change, are not afraid to disrupt. Old people who are typically in charge of the governments don't want any change. And they say, let's keep everything. Tradition is more important. Keep everything the same. So what are some of the soft skills of innovation economy? Well, you can have a fixed mindset, even though you are young, or you can have an entrepreneurial mindset. This has nothing to do with age. As a fixed mindset, you say, I'm afraid of change. I don't want any change. Status quo is great. Entrepreneurial mindset says, I strive for change. I want to look as ways to change, get myself into situations that are disrupting existing things and have a positive impact. Fixed mindset says success comes from talent. If I wasn't born with talent, if I don't have blue blood, if I am not born into a rich family, I don't have good genes, I can't do anything. Entrepreneurial mindset says success comes from effort. I'm going to go and try. <laughs> I will learn. I will get better as I do it more. Fixed mindset says I don't like challenges. Entrepreneurial mindset says challenge is an opportunity to learn. Failure means I can't do it. Entrepreneurial mindset says failure means I'm gaining knowledge. When I fail, I learn, I become better. Look at the best coaches who are training Olympic champions. They don't just train them to become Olympic champions and win, they train them not to give up when they lose. Because you talk to any Olympic champion, you talk to any champion in any sport, talk to Federer, talk to Michael Jordan, every one of them, they tell you, 
They have lost more matches. They have lost more games that they have won. Their secret was after they lost, they didn't give up. They went and analyzed it, improved upon it. So the next one, they won. In fixed mindset, somebody gives you a feedback, you get defensive and you say it's personal attack. Why are you telling me this? In entrepreneurial mindset, you seek feedback. You go and talk to your customers. You go and talk to your potential investors. You talk to your friends. Don't keep your ideas to yourself. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Get feedback. Figure out what idea is good, what is not, and seek feedback, meaningful feedback. In fixed mindset, the only way you succeed is by pushing other people down. So if other people succeed, you feel threatened. In entrepreneurial mindset, you help other people succeed, but you strive to be better than them. And you win by moving up rather than pushing other people down. So you collaborate, you help everyone. And in fixed mindset, you said, I don't want to share my ideas. Entrepreneurial mindset says teams are much stronger, much greater. Learn to collaborate, create a team. Don't start a company on your own. Go and find two, three people that compliment you and use the power of the team to win. Now, at Global Innovation Catalyst, we have tried to create those 10 million innovation jobs we went and looked into where have been the places of success. What were the roots of Silicon Valley for entrepreneurship, and how could this come along? We created a program, 12 week program. Actually, we have had a couple uh, versions of this first in France uh, last year, then early part of this year in Azerbaijan to try it and we have created a 12-week experiential learning program to teach itechpreneurship. It's basically a combination of content, community, and execution. Our tagline is, you learn while you work and innovate while you learn. We went and got access to Stanford Center for Professional Development Content, courses that have been taught the last 30 years to help create Silicon Valley. We created facilitated workshops and network of experts to help with people to go through this program. And at the end of 12 weeks, the ones who succeed in making the projects and pitch it properly and uh, get the, the people convinced, uh, they uh, judges, you receive a certificate of completion from Stanford Center for Professional Development. And it's based on this course that has been taught for the last 30 years or so, Ideas to Market program at Stanford Center for Professional Development. And it's really an online program because of the virus, available globally to everyone. And it has weekly workshops, mentoring webinars, and final pitches. And uh, we are starting this, this June. First one will be the global one that uh, we accept people and projects from all over the world to experiment. And each time we are making it bigger and bigger. And uh, our goal is to go and create 10 million innovation jobs. We need to learn how to do things in a global way with many people cooperating with each other. And I would really look forward to take us a and m and getting your programs to see how we could cooperate with each other uh, to get some of these things to be uh, diffused and propagated, uh, not just within Houston, but all over uh, Texas or all over the US. We have a lot of uh, rural areas uh, within the US. We are working with a few organizations in. Um, uh, uh, the 
economically challenged areas of uh, U.S. in Michigan because of the auto industry is uh, changing and is uh, dying in many of the ways that uh, if you look at it, uh, as you look at that pyramid, the move is towards electronics, towards software, towards uh, algorithmic content. Why is Tesla having a higher value than General Motors? Uh, uh, Tesla doesn't have any mechanical, electromechanical, very little mechanical. There is no radiator, there is no carburetor, there is no piston engine, and there is no uh, transmission and no gears, whatever. So if a university is creating a lot of uh, mechanical engineers, electromechanical engineers, those people would be without jobs. Uh, the robots um, do a fine job of many of those kinds of tasks. And uh, uh, we don't need so much of that. Uh, so how do you go and address the auto industry within Michigan and uh, help reskill and teach the jobs of future to them? Uh, all over Africa, all over Latin America, uh, Asia, uh, similar uh, transformations are, are happening. And our goal as an organization is uh, to come up with the right partnership and uh, diffuse the knowledge and uh, train a lot of people into the right kinds of things and help them uh, create the leaders of innovation economy. And uh, with that in mind, I love Peter Drucker who says, uh, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And uh, young entrepreneurs, uh, uh, your students which are listening to this really are the ones that I'm hoping can be inspired to go and create uh, the future of the world. Thank you so much. Happy to answer uh, any questions if there are some. Well, first of all, Cameron, I mean, just, just like I promised, I mean, you are just simply the ultimate visionary. I mean, and uh, we can learn so much from you and really appreciate your, uh, you know, your talk today. I've gotten a lot of comments, people just, you know, asking, hey, can, can we get this? Can we get this? We want to we wanna hear this again. And so it was really great. And thank you so much. Um, uh, there is, I don't know how much time you've got, Cameron, but certainly there, I'm sure there's a, there's a handful of people that have questions. I mean, do you have a little bit of time? Of course. Happy to. Excellent. So, so David Flint, Professor David Flint um, actually teaches, one, among other things at a and he teaches value creation. Um, and he had a question for you. Um, is he, are you advising developing markets to try and leapfrog over the developed markets, jumping to newer technologies, newer urban models, newer educational models, et cetera. The pattern for the last 70 years has been to follow the patterns of the past, light industry at the start, then more manufacturing, exporting, et cetera, like Japan did, South Korea did, Taiwan, Singapore, et cetera. Is it time to drop that pattern and go to leapfrogging? Absolutely. You took the words out of my mouth. Uh, uh, we. Oh. One of the groups that I've been uh, had the honor and pleasure to work with is uh, uh, Dr. Albert Zufak, who is the chief economist of World Bank for Africa, and uh, uh, also the chief economist of World Bank for uh, uh, Middle East. Uh, is uh, uh, his name escapes me right now. Uh, uh, he's from uh, Algiers, and I can picture him. But I've had the honor and pleasure to work with both of them. And uh, one of the first things uh, that we discussed was leapfrog. Uh, just because the Western world went through agricultural economy, industrial economy, then the knowledge economy, then uh, innovation economy, should Africa or Middle East go through the same thing? Should India go through the same thing? Uh, should Latin America go through the thing? Absolutely not. Uh, anybody who is trying to <laughs> bring uh, manufacturing back uh, up and uh, doing the things that the old fashioned way as manufacturing as a job is a misguided person who doesn't understand where the future is. Uh, the future of humanity is not uh, to be like busy bees going around and sitting and uh, you know turning the screws and uh, doing this and that. We are way behind that and uh, exploitation of cheap uh, labor for uh, manufacturing, all of that is gone. Uh, you go to Tesla, manufacturing has very few, very few workers. And that manufacturing is done by robots. And uh, 
you go to any of the advanced semiconductor manufacturing, advanced electronic manufacturing, everything is done by robots. And that is not a high value creation approach. Uh, the best is to go zero in leapfrog and go and look at what is important on innovation economy and teach the hard skills and soft skills of innovation economy. And as I say, teach people to collaborate, to open up all this nonsense about my IP, your IP, the patents, all of these things. These are all the way of the past thinking about it. Uh, uh, a Chinese government actually who has been accused of stealing so much IP in the past, uh, they went and did a very clever thing. Uh, you know, I travel all over the world and I'm a global citizen. I don't play politics of one region versus another. I just uh, speak my mind. They did a very clever thing. Uh, they created their patent office that went and started to issue patents for every Tom, Dick and Harry that had some inventions uh, uh, from a Chinese company. And they said, if an American company sues us for our patents so that uh, you cannot get the uh, uh, we cannot sell our products in US. We would sue them uh, with our Chinese patents. They cannot sell their products in China. And if our economy becomes bigger or uh, the same thing, then this whole issue goes away. This is how disruption happens. And because of uh, the shareware, because of the open platforms, uh, if you want to see uh, the way you can live without patents, uh, uh, look at uh, the uh, work about uh, uh, what is the platform uh, uh, the, this Harvard professor created a, a platform that uh, is all based on honor system and all of the things are available in there, you put your invention, your IP there, and anybody who uh, uses that can uh, have uh, uh, access to it. Uh, the requirement is they have to put back uh, the information there. And, uh, you know, the whole idea uh, behind patents was that uh, you would describe the concept uh, in a way uh, so that it could be replicated by somebody else. The idea behind patent was uh, uh, a way to diffuse the knowledge. If you describe your invention in a simple word that anybody could uh, follow and uh, replicate it, then you would be issued a patent. And for your work, you would get a few thousand dollars, not as a way to stop innovation. And unfortunately, we have got these patent tro uh, trolls who are uh, uh, using this as a way to make money and block innovation. By the way, the platform I was thinking of is called Creative Commons. Look at Creative Commons, it's a platform, <laughs> very enlightened one. And uh, it is uh, the way that uh, human beings can work based on an honor system together as a global community. So absolutely, leapfrog is uh, the way. And uh, if we look at the evolution of our species, we went from having peace within our family in a cave and fighting with everyone else to creating a village and having peace in a village and fighting every other village to creating a town, to creating a city, to creating a country having peace in the country, fighting everyone else to create Uber countries. Uber countries, first one was United States. The second one was EU. The third one is African Union, AU. That is the way of evolution of our species. And the only way we could go to explore Mars, to explore our uh, billions of stars in uh, billions of different galaxies is by us uniting our uh, forces and do something. Uh, the only entity outside planet Earth is a space station. Is they, does space sta station belong to America, belong to China, belong to Russia? No, belongs to humanity. 
20, 30 some countries came together and built it and run it and operate it. That's a very simple fact. So anybody who takes you back to, you know, France first, Germany first, America first, Japan first, China first, these are all misguided, old fashioned, backward thinkers. The way of the future is humanity first. Leapfrog, look into the future of humanity. It's all about unification, cooperation, and figuring out how we go to the frontiers of the future. Not by building walls and isolating ourselves and trying to take us back to uh, 15th, 16th, 17th century. Excellent, thank you, Cameron. Uh, Dr. Mahajan, Arvind has a question for you. Well, I know it's, uh, it's uh, past time, right? You're supposed to finish at two, Richard? That was the plan, but, but Cameron, you know, just he, okay. had a lot to, he had a lot to share with us, which is, which is yeah. A-OK. -okay. A -okay. As long as he's able to stay with us, I'm good. Right, I don't yeah. want to impose on him. Uh, but no, I, I can stay another 15 minutes. It will be my pleasure, honor. Okay, well, you know, uh, Cameron, uh, Richard had shared your background and our expectations were very high from this uh, engagement today. But I must say, uh, you have far exceeded them. Uh, <laughs> and I, I appreciate very kind. much your, your sharing your wisdom, in particular clarity of thought, which can only come from experience of doing things. And, and your arguments are so compelling that they really cannot be ignored. And uh, you really are very inspiring. And my question uh, was a broad one as someone who deals in higher education as to what is the role of higher education in this process? And I ask this in the context, for example, of the magic of Silicon Valley. And as you know, being, being a part of that, how many of foreign born people have run the show in Silicon Valley? It's a very significant amount. And the rationale for that, from what I understood, was it was not where somebody was born, but the environment within which they could experiment. And America was the place where that culture existed. And it existed again from my perspective from the history of this country because it's such a young country. And the culture has emanated from there, which was go west young man, mm -hmm. which basically was about risk taking, not risk seeking, but risk taking. It was an inherent part of the culture, unlike many ancient traditional societies with a lot of knowledge but absence of risk taking. And what I am trying to understand is what is not happening in this country and in this culture, which might be impeding its progress along the lines you mentioned in the context of the fourth wave, which we are in uh, of disruption. Uh, why is it and where should it start? Should it start from childhood? Is it a part of K through 12? Or is it a part of higher education? Because when it comes to higher education, the die of the mindset in a way already has been set. And then we are trying to undo it and rejig it. So my question to you is of course, institutions like Texas A&M and Stanford must do their part. But should we, or can we, as institutions of higher education, through our training of teachers, through the education school, bring some of that into K through 12 kind of a mindset? And where do you see we can help in that process? Uh, very uh, thoughtful. First of all, thanks a lot for your kind uh, words. Uh, uh, I always uh, joke about it. The only part of uh, 
wisdom in me is my wisdom teeth and thank god i've still held on to them uh, these kinds of accusations don't work for me when i get old i might uh, become wise but uh, not yet uh, but uh, uh, education is key and as i mentioned uh, before uh, education 3.0 is not about teaching it's about experiential learning and uh, it takes us a and m and uh, uh, being a very fine institution, if you create uh, environments, the example of a tech hub that I mentioned would be a safe place that people can go and experiment and would not be reprimanded for failure. They go and come up with idea and let them go through that and look at it as experiential learning because different people have different talents they don't know. Uh, you know, if you work in a big company, uh, you are pigeonholed. Uh, when I started, uh, finished uh, my master's, I went and I uh, came to Silicon Valley. I worked in a very prestigious uh, company, HP, in their corporate engineering labs. And uh, as great as it was, as wonderful as it was, I was pigeonholed into an R&D person and uh, doing this. And when I started my first company, in the first six months, I learned <laughs> much more than all my time at HP. Why? Because at HP, I had never met a marketing person. I'd never met a finance person. I'd never met a, uh, you know, a salesperson. I was secluded. When I started my company, within a short period, I had to learn what the hell is sales? What is marketing? What is finance? What type of people I need? Where I go, it is experiential learning. And I had to go and take some courses. We didn't have online courses at that time. I took some courses from uh, junior colleges around and I tried to read books and um, do the best and try to go to seminars, learn from other entrepreneurs, whatever. But the key thing is emphasis should be on experiential learning. And the purpose of a university should be, in my opinion, to become a safe place to allow people with different nationalities, different ideology, different backgrounds, technical, social, business, uh, uh, artistic, let them come together in a safe space, learn from each other, do projects together, come up with some crazy ideas, and you don't know what you don't know. Which one of you could have predicted that uh, a company like Facebook could come out of a university that would have a couple billion users. The Uber country of Facebook is bigger than China in terms of number of citizens in there. Uh, they, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, you know, companies like uh, Instagram, companies like uh, Snap come out of nowhere all of a sudden a few hundred million people are sharing some ideas, some of the things together and you look at you know, how long it took them uh, to become uh, what they did. And innovation is not restricted to Silicon Valley anymore. You know, uh, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, uh, they, uh, they came from Seattle. Uh, Dell came from Austin. Uh, a lot started to diffuse within the uh, United States. Then you look at so many companies, Skype, uh, came from uh, Estonia and Sweden. Uh, Spotify came from uh, UK, you know. Uh, the company that Uber bought, uh, paid uh, 3.2 billion for it, called Karim. Uh, started from uh, Jordan and uh, UAE uh, with a Pakistani guy and an Arab kid uh, together starting uh, Karim. And, uh, you know, last year sold it to Uber for over $3 billion. Uh, Grab uh, in Indonesia is uh, uh, Uber version uh, uh, for Indonesian, uh, Singapore, uh, Thailand, uh, Philippines. It's extremely popular. Taxify in Africa is amazingly popular. There is innovation growing everywhere. Uh, the brains are everywhere. It is uh, because of entrepreneurship we can inspire and let the young people go and create new businesses that were never possible before. If you look at the growth of Alipay, 
in Africa is higher than most of the banks combined. Mobile payment by Alibaba. It's the, we are living in an interconnected global world. And the leaders who are visionary, who understand humanity, who understand that we are all united at our core as a being, regardless of uh, uh, religion, regardless of the uh, artificial borders. You know, I can um, tell you a, a great story from uh, uh, my friend uh, Anusha Ansari. Anusha actually is an entrepreneur. She and her husband from Dallas, Texas, uh, they created their high-tech company 20 years ago and they sold it about 10 years ago uh, for a few hundred million, made a lot of money. And Uche, from childhood, she wanted to be uh, an astronaut. And uh, she went to Kazakhstan, actually, and uh, paid uh, the Kazakh government money and uh, with the Russian system uh, to uh, someone like, I can't remember, 20 million or so uh, money. Uh, to learn to become an astronaut. And uh, she uh, was Iranian-American. So astronauts want to put uh, the symbols of their country there. So she wanted to put flag of Iran on one side and flag of United States in another side. And of course, because of the politics, there were all politicians complaining. And she said, look, I'm not taking money from US. I'm not taking money from Iran, I'm a, an independent global citizen. I'm a, a going to put the flags of the country that I was born in and the country that I live in. And uh, I love both countries, both people. I'm gonna do it. So she went to the space station and, uh, uh, you know, on the space station, uh, what is it, every uh, 41 minutes or every 91 minutes, I can't remember, uh, it uh, turns uh, across the whole planet. So she was so excited to go and uh, find Iran from up there. And she kept looking and she kept looking and she kept looking and she couldn't find it. <laughs> she could see Persian Gulf, she could see Caspian Sea, but there is no line between Russia, Iran, uh, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Iran, India, Iran, Pakistan, Iran. You don't see any of those lines. You can't find Iran. <laughs> it is impossible. And then she wanted to find America. And guess what? No lines between U.S. and Mexico. No lines between U.S. and Canada. You can't find it. And she said, why the hell was I paying so much attention to this mumbo jumbo bullshit symbolic uh, artificial borders? Mm -hmm. And she started, when she came back, she called me up and she said, Cameron, why don't we work together to create a passport for global citizenship? and <laughs> Let the people who have thinking of the future to go and cooperate with each other. If it is okay, uh, I would like to hear from one or two of your students, especially uh, young students. Uh, I would love to hear that. Uh, has anybody uh, asked any questions uh, from them? Yeah, so, so one of our MBAs was actually asking if the GMC IX program is open to all. Yes, it is open uh, to all and uh, you can go to globalinnovationcatalyst.com and uh, uh, check it out. Uh, next week, uh, we are uh, formally announcing it. Uh, uh, I uh, took the opportunity to tell you in advance uh, the exact dates. All of that will be announced uh, next week uh, and uh, uh, the conditions. Uh, but. Uh, since I was giving a talk, I thought I'd uh, give you an advance notice. So uh, it's uh, in the spirit of cooperation. I have uh, shared a lot of information that's not public yet. <laughs> that's awesome. One, 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 actually, I've got an interesting question from, uh, it's a, a student who's actually uh, leaving the engineering field and going into business, future MBA. So it looks like it could be one of our admits. Um, what are the key points to diving in and hitting the ground running? Is it a bit of uncertainty, a scare, uh, for lack of a better word? Would you mind to let him or her to ask the question? I want to see the face and let the, hear yeah. the question from their uh, selves if they have good broadband. Alejandro, Alejandro, are you, are you on? Uh, can, you, 
Richard, can you minimize the, so that we can see everyone? Can you minimize yeah. the? Um, yeah, we just have to stop. Uh, if you, uh, uh, Cameron, if you just stop sharing your screen, it, we will, uh, it will allow us to see everybody. Okay, let me stop doing that. Sorry about that. I should have uh, thought of it sooner. Meanwhile, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes? I can hear you, Alejandro. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I am an engineer by degree. Worked at Kimberly Clark. I worked with Parker & Gamble. I worked with We Energies, Coal Power Energy. So what you were saying resonated a lot with me, you know? Um, so I'm leaving the engineering field. Just got admitted, class of 2022 for MBA from a and Going into the business world, uh, leaving engineering is a very nervous for me. It's going into something that I do not know at all. Um, but from your talk today, I'm very motivated. I'm very excited, especially with everything that you were saying that you yourself were an engineer and obviously very successful in the business world. But what is your key points to diving in? Uh, yes, of course, going without being scared, but what are some barriers from being an engineer to going into business that you had to break? Okay, a couple of the things. Uh, well, first of all, having fear is uh, normal. Uh, don't ever believe for a second that there is a fearless person out there. That's a uh, uh, nonsense. A fearless person doesn't live very long. <laughs> they get uh, killed very quickly. Uh, it is learning how to overcome your fear and learning how to take calculated risks that makes you gives you a chance uh, to succeed. So overcoming the fear is uh, uh, the first thing. And uh, second thing is, um, as an engineer, we are trained to always look for weaknesses, look for uh, problems, and try to solve it. Uh, this can be extremely valuable because uh, when you start a company, or when you join a company, there are always a lot of problems that uh, you have to uh, solve. So if you have engineering background, you could be very good about that. But if you decide to go and uh, uh, try to do something in business, just highlighting uh, weaknesses uh, is not going to be a uh, very winning strategy. Uh, as engineers, we always look for the flaws and weaknesses. And I will tell you a story. Uh, when I got married with my wife, within a couple of years, we had a small car. And because I ha we had no money, I used to try to fix the car myself, which was I was a disaster as a mechanic. But uh, uh, when we tried to sell the car, uh, people would come and tell me, so is this a good car? I would say, well, I don't know. The brakes had this problem. I fixed it six months ago. The transmission had this problem. I worked on it for a year and a half and I couldn't fix it. This and that people would just say no. And then nobody wanted to buy the car. And uh, so I got frustrated. My wife said, uh, you go and take a break and uh, uh, leave home. I came back and she had an auction going on. Uh, two different people were outbidding each other to buy the car. And I said, how could this be possible? She says, I told them, here's a car. And uh, my husband is uh, crazy about uh, taking good care of the car. Go and drive it around, show it to a mechanic. If you like it, buy it. And it's a very good value. And uh, people did that and they all want it. And I, noted, I learned a lot that, hey, in marketing, you don't go and tell everybody how screwed up everything is. You say the positives of the thing. If you are an engineer, you always look for the weaknesses. So going through a shift, I'm not saying that in marketing you hide the weaknesses. It is where you put the spotlight. Where do you shine it? If you go and first put the spotlight on the positives and then as people do due diligence, as they ask you, you share some of the weaknesses. But many times as an engineer, you just will put the spotlight on all the weaknesses. Nobody would buy your product. Imagine if I came and I told you, I have this car called the Tesla. It's a fantastic car uh, that uh, is a great uh, uh, 
for a family of four and uh, you can really enjoy it and uh, it is uh, very comfortable it's very nice that's selling it with putting spotlight on a positive on the other token i can come and say well this is a car uh, for family of four if your family is six or eight or ten if you need a truck, if you need a school bus, this is horrible. You cannot carry 30 students in it. You cannot haul five tons of things. <laughs> I'm telling all the negatives of that. And instead of putting the emphasis on the positive. Mm -hmm. So learning how to mix and match these things and uh, learning uh, from good business people the right kinds of things. Marketing is one of the most important thing. Product marketing, not promotional marketing, not corporate marketing. Product marketing, engineers who learn uh, technical marketing and become good product marketing are worth their weight in gold because they can use their technical background to have the substance, but at the same time, they uh, develop the skills of marketing and learning how to do segmentation of the market, how to create MVPs, most valuable product, uh, minimum viable product, sorry, a minimum viable product because you cannot uh, develop a product full of a lot of features. You have to learn how to develop a product uh, within your budget with minimum features that is acceptable and then expand upon it. Facebook today is used by everybody, but the first serve of Facebook only was usable and sold to undergraduates at Harvard University. That was it. Did very few things, but it was good enough to get it started. Uh, iPhone uh, did not start with iPhone 11, started with iPhone 1, which to, in today's thing, you would just laugh at it and say, who would have ever bought that? But it had the minimum viable set of products for its time. 15 years ago to be viable, so people bought it. Uh, Cameron, can we, have, can we have one final question? Sure. Ali Askari has been very patient. Uh, I, hi, Ali. <laughs> uh, if I can ask his question, he wants your opinion on the potentials for autonomous last mile delivery solutions and the best strategy to raise fund at early stage. Um, I guess uh, you are looking at the use of drones for last night uh, delivery as uh, a, uh, a business. Uh, anybody who asks me, do you think uh, this is a good business idea or not? Or uh, do you think I should do this or not? Uh, my answer is, who am I to tell you uh, whether something is good or not? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to buy your product. I'm not going to invest in your company. I'm not uh, your uh, uh, customer. Why don't you go and ask that? And instead of trying to uh, worry about whether an idea is good or not, use the basics of experiential learning. Uh, arrange a, a meeting with uh, your uh, uh, within your local area, some angel investors, some VCs, and the worst case is you go and talk with them and they say it's a horrible idea. And uh, you learn from that experientially. And uh, the world of venture capital is so diverse. You know, in, uh, uh, when I started my first company, there were about 30 VC funds uh, and uh, they were all hidden. Uh, we didn't have internet to know where they are. And I remember when I had uh, my first uh, meeting uh, with the first VC, I thought that our idea was uh, so advanced that uh, nobody else had thought of it because we came from such a prestigious group at HP. And I found out, uh, he asked me, how about the uh, Daisy Microsystems? I said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, this company started a year ago. We talked with them. And what is better about your idea than theirs? And I was totally surprised. Uh, what the hell is he talking about? And uh, uh, I asked him, why didn't you put your name in uh, some uh, uh, yellow pages or uh, some uh, directory? He said, if you cannot find a way to find me, you don't deserve funding from me. 
because if you don't learn how to find investors uh, on your own, you cannot uh, find customers, you cannot find employees, you cannot find partners. You have to learn how to find people. So I took that advice to heart. But today, the situation is reversed. The situation is not one or two or five VC funds. We have thousands and globally tens of thousands of VC funds and we have millions of angel investors and nobody knows who is interested in what and uh, which idea might make sense for which part of the world, uh, which part of uh, uh, which geography, which sector. Uh, so uh, my advice to you is don't ask me, ask somebody who could be your angel investor who could be your uh, venture capital investor. Um, try to seek them out. There is thousands of them or hundreds of them around in wherever you are. Find them, learn the skills of how finding them. And uh, the skills are rather simple. Uh, look at who is a player in uh, last mile delivery, in uh, drone delivery, in automated delivery for last mile which companies already are existing within your city, existing within your state, within your country, and uh, see who has invested in them. That becomes your target list because those people, at least they know something about that vertical. And don't go into the ones who are on the board of some of the existing companies they have invested. Uh, go and chase the ones who have a minority position in, uh, in your competitors or your potential competitors. Those who have minority investment are best targets because they know about that vertical, they know about that field, uh, they can help you, but because they are not a, a significant investor in a company, uh, they don't have any restrictions and uh, they could be doing a minority investment in many companies. Thank you so much. We, you are always inspiring to all of us and we follow you wherever you are. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Ali. So Great to see all right, you. Thank you. Great, Great to see you. All right. Well, all right. you know, thank you, Cameron, again so much. I mean, really, really happy to have you here. I can't wait till I run into you again, um, like we did in Astana. Um, and um, yeah, just, you know, I'll be in touch and just really so grateful for the time that you've shared with the. Uh, Mace Business School today and all of our community. No, it's uh, my pleasure and uh, my honor uh, to uh, have had uh, this session with all of you and uh, would be happy to have uh, uh, more talks in the future. So uh, uh, great meeting you, love you all and uh, let's stay in touch and friend me on, uh, 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 I can't friend you on LinkedIn and uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook but on Instagram you can friend me or on Twitter uh, unfortunately LinkedIn and Facebook have limits that uh, uh, I have reached and uh, I cannot uh, it really pisses me off uh, that LinkedIn has a maximum of uh, 30,000 it's crazy I don't know why <laughs> they do that <laughs> it's it's really annoying I've been at that limit for like four years now it's horrible it is horrible it's just you have to awesome. remove people to add new people it's crazy yeah yeah Cameron, thank you again so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Stay well, my friend. Bye-bye.